I'll raise for you, will it be? Please be seated. Mr. Groom, please proceed. Your Honor, the, um, the flickering problem has been solved. The sound problem has only been partially solved. So I will not be playing any audio of the videos, but I will be asking the Chamber to look at them, and we will see about what we can do to um, remedy that for tomorrow. Your Honor, the video that was showing, I might just point out, about halfway through that video, you could see Mr. Milosevic shaking the hand and greeting Mr. Samatovich. And then you can see at the end of that video, Mr. Stanisic giving both Mr. Milosevic and Mihail Kurtez awards on behalf of the special units of the Serbian DB. The prosecution's case is broader than simply the relationship between Slobodan Milosevic, Mihail Kurtez, Jovica Stanisic, and Franko Samatovic. The prosecution will establish in this trial that the crimes charged in the indictment were perpetrated as part of a joint criminal enterprise, a collective criminal effort. It is the prosecution's case that Mr. Stanisic and Mr. Samanovich were willing members in a core group of persons who shared the intent to remove large, populations of non-Serbs, mostly Muslims and Croats, from their homes and land by force. Doing this by perpetrating the crimes of murder and persecution. In some cases, their lands were targeted because they lay in areas in which Serbs were a majority. In other cases, their lands were targeted because the land was necessary to bridge disconnected concentrations of Serbs. In other cases, their land was targeted simply because it was considered a necessary acquisition in order to secure the success of the overall plan. The crimes perpetrated during the conflict are of a magnitude and a scale that challenge our ability to comprehend them in the detail we need in the context of a criminal trial. It can be equally difficult to conceptualize the large group of people who must necessarily work with a common purpose towards realization of those crimes. Each person in this collective having a different contribution to make, having a different position and role to play in the enterprise. 
I submit that this diagram on slide number 16 as one way of conceptualizing this core group of perpetrators. While it is undoubtedly an oversimplification of the joint criminal enterprise, it is a starting point. As we progress through the trial, the court will become aware of the nuances in the relationships between these core members that I cannot capture in such a simple diagram. The vertical columns represent, from left to right, core members of the joint criminal enterprise who were Croatian Serbs, Serbs in Serbia proper, and Bosnian Serbs. The top row represents those core members who were in the military. The middle row, those who held governmental positions or figures or whose contribution is best characterized as political. And the bottom row, those participants who worked in the respective MUPs of the three regions. As you can see, Mr. Stanisic appears in both the political and the Ministry of Internal Affairs boxes. This is because his role in the joint criminal enterprise extended beyond his job in the State Security Service. As you will hear on this intercept I will play, his actions are in some cases best characterized as political. In the intercept on slide 17, you can hear Jovica Stanisic and Radovan Karadic discussing Milan Babic, a prominent leader of the Croatian Serbs in the Kraina. <laughs> Shut off the sound. I would just give the chamber just a couple of seconds to to view the, the, the text and then I will move on. In this conversation, we can hear Mr. Stanisic and Mr. Karadic express their view that Babbage is not adept in political matters. Stanisic informs Karadic that he has had a serious discussion with Babbage about how he should act politically. Similarly, as you can see on the left-hand side of the diagram, Milan Martic can be found not only in the Republika Srpska Krajina, or the RSK, Ministry of Internal Affairs, but also in the box for RSK political figures. This represents the dual role he played. Ms. Breermeyer Metz and myself will come back to this diagram on several occasions during the course of the opening statement. The prosecution over the course of this trial will establish the shared intent of these core members with a primary focus on the accused present, their intent and their acts of contribution to the overall criminal plan. It is difficult to trace the roots of a covert criminal plan, particularly in a case such as this, in which secrecy and surprise was viewed as an essential component of the plan's success. As best we can determine, we see the germination of this criminal plan in the words of its primary architect, Slobodan Milosevic. 
Slide number 19 shows the words of Milosevic, the words which he spoke on the 16th of March in 1991 to a closed group of deputies after a period of steadily increasing tensions. In this context, and at a meeting with the presidents of Serb municipalities, Milosevic said, quote, the government has been tasked with creating suitable units which will make us safe at all times. That is, capable of defending the interests of our republic, but also the interests of Serbs outside Serbia." End quote. It is the prosecution's case that approximately six weeks after Milosevic gave this order for the creation of special units tasked with protecting Serb interests outside Serbia, Jovica Stanisic established these units in the State Security Department of the Serbian Ministry of Internal Affairs. Let me once again direct your attention to the dedication ceremony in Kula in May of 1997, where Franko Samadovic gave a retrospective of the special unit's history. a candid history of it in a private setting to a select group of people. Here on slide number 21, you can take a look at the two statements side by side. And consider that there is no other unit that we know of that Milosevic created. It becomes clear that we are talking about one and the same unit. Samadovich would go on to say in this speech, quote, the contribution of the Special Operation Unit is enormous. 47 so soldiers were killed and 250 wounded in combat operations at 50 different locations. Close quote. With his own words, Samatovic tells us that the special units of the Serbian DB operated in 50 different locations in Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. He would also say, quote, 26 training camps for special police units of Republika Srpska and the Republic of Serbian Krajina were also formed in that period. Close quote. 26 training camps in Bosnia and Croatia. The genesis of the special units was the day that Milosevic charged Stanisic with the task of establishing a covert fighting force, not bound by the law, but only by the dictates of Milosevic. On this day, which we are able to identify with no greater precision that it was during the spring of 1991, Stanisic would join Milosevic's plan to ensure that in the breakup of Yugoslavia, a breakup which appeared inevitable, in this breakup they would ensure that Serbs came out on top, regardless of in which republic those Serbs were, and regardless of the cost or harm to other ethnic populations in Yugoslavia. Stanisic, in turn, would give the day-to-day -day administration of the special unit to his most entrusted subordinate, 
Franco Samatovich. From the outset, secrecy was an important principle for the unit. Former members of the unit who will come before you and testify will describe how they only learned that they were working for the Serbian DB sometime after they were full-fledged members of the special unit. Often these men only knew their comrades by aliases and nicknames, forbidden to reveal or ask another's name. Such secrecy helped create confusion over who was behind the unit. Public knowledge that the Serbian DB had created and ma maintained such an extra legal unit would have had negative consequences for Milosevic. Such secrecy was also essential because Milosevic, Stanisic, Samatovic, and other members of the core, the core group knew that their work in Croatia and Bosnia. If I give you a sign to slow down, then look at me, then I'll tell you when you can continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Appreciate that. Please proceed. They knew that their work in Croatia and Bosnia would be criminal, involving the perpetration of serious crimes against the non-Serb populations there. They realized at the outset what the world would come to understand as the tragedy unfolded. You cannot forcibly remove large civilian populations from their homes without committing grave crimes against them. I would like to play, hopefully, an intercept for you to illustrate Mr. Stanisic's ever-present concern for secrecy. On slide number 22, Stanisic reminds Karadzic that they must be careful what they say on the telephone. That's... That's not possible. We can't do that. I have nothing here. I need to install. The interpreters apologize, but they cannot hear what the speaker is saying. Your Honor, if I could uh, perhaps give a direction to the, to the director, please do not play any more audio, and I will proceed without audio, and hopefully the problem can be corrected for tomorrow. If you just briefly point at what the quintessence is of the, um, of the um, <clears throat> clips you'd like to play or the audio you'd like to play, then the chamber and the public will understand what you're talking about. In another intercept, Stanisic says to Carriage, quote, could you maybe do it in a way so that I am not shown as part of the initiative? Close quote. In other intercepts, you will hear Franko Samadovic talk in guarded, cryptic sentences to another core member of the criminal enterprise. The map that Stanisic shows Milosevic 
in the earlier clip is affixed to the wall at the Kostic Training Center in Kula. It is a map of Yugoslavia and has markers identifying all of the places in Croatia and Bosnia where the special units were, their training camps. Mr. Samatovic lists these locations in his speech. Here on the bottom left corner of slide 23 is a photo still of that map. On the right are those same locations marked on a standard map of Yugoslavia. Those indicated in green boxes are located in Croatia, those in yellow in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Those in pink are located in Serbia proper. Over the course of their establishment and evolution, the special units of the Serbian DB would refer to themselves by several names. Slide number 24 contains a list of these names, as well as some of the badges that members of the special units displayed on their uniforms. Some of these names, such as the JATD and the JSO, would be official names used within the State Security Service. Some of the units were named after the individuals who led that particular unit. Arkans men, Arkans tigers, Martich's men, Captain Dragon's Keninjas. One of the names they are commonly referred to described the headgear they often wore on operations the Red Berets. Your Honors, the Special Units of the Serbian DB was a large organization with many members. We will, throughout this opening, introduce you to a few of the most prominent members. Those particular members you will hear referred to numerous times during this trial.
The last person I want to introduce you to at this juncture is Rajo Bozovic, here on slide number 27. Rajo Bozovic was one of the most senior members of the special units and appears in many places throughout the former Yugoslavia. You will hear witnesses describe him as being in charge of the Red Beret operations in Doboj, the Drina Valley region, and in Western Bosnia. The prosecution will also tender payment records establishing his relationship to the state security service. We could play the video without sound. Over the course of the celebration in Kula in May 1997, Mr. Stanisic would give Mr. Milosevic a tour of the equipment the special unit of the Serbian DB had. In this video clip, Milosevic is shown a mobile operating room armored personnel carriers, and trucks with rocket launchers and anti-aircraft guns mounted on the back. Keeping in mind that the legal mandate entrusted to Mr. Stanisic and Mr. Samatovic's department was the collection of data and information, these images make clear that the unit had equipped itself for a di very different task. While the idea of creating a special unit was conceived in Belgrade, its birth would be in the Kraina during the spring of 1991. The Kraina is the southern part of Croatia and extends downward along the Dalmatian coast. The Kraina had a large majority of Serbs who felt increasingly vulnerable as they listened to the nationalistic Croatian rhetoric being spoken in Zagreb. In the context of this fear and mistrust, several ordinary Croatian Serbs would rise to prominence and become pivotal players in the unfolding events. I would like to introduce you to some of them now. Milan Babic was the first prime minister and president of the government of the Serbian autonomous region of the Kraina. This self-declared region was more commonly referred to as the SAO Kraina. He testified in several trials before the tribunal and pled guilty to the crime of persecution. He was sentenced to a term of incarceration of 13 years. A little over three years ago, he committed suicide in the UN detention unit. His testimony before this tribunal sets out the events of the Kraina from an insider's perspective. Admission of that testimony is a matter that is pending before this chamber, and I will therefore refrain from discussing his testimony during this opening. Another Croatian Serb who rose to prominence was a local police official by the name of Milan Martic. In time, he would come to hold several leadership positions in the SAO Kraina and subsequently so-called Republic of Serbian Kraina. On the 12th of June, 2007, a trial chamber convicted him of murder, persecutions, deportation, and other crimes. Here on slide number 30, 
you can see an excerpt from his driver, a witness in this case, describing how Milan Martic and Jovica Stanisic met regularly. This close relationship becomes apparent in September 1991, after Milan Martic was arrested in the Bosnian town of Bosanka, Bosanka Krupa. His release was arranged after a series of telephone calls, one of which I will play as an example. The call transcribed on slide 31 is a call from the 9th of September, 1991. In this intercepted phone conversation, we not only see Milosevic and Karadzic discussing, discussing how to free Martic after he was arrested, but how Jovica serves as the person who was carrying Milosevic's directives to another core member of the joint criminal enterprise. The special units of the Serbian DB would take their initial form by supporting, training, and facilitating the crimes committed against the non-Serb population of the Krajina. Franko Samatovic personally oversaw this effort. When he first went to the Krajina, he would take with him a person by the name of Dragan Vasilkovic, who would develop the training program. Dragan Vasilkovic, also known as Captain Dragon, born in Serbia, moved with his parents to Australia and returned to Yugoslavia in early 1990. He was a veteran soldier, and the DB took advantage of his experience and sent him to the Krajina in order to act as an instructor for the newly established Krajina police forces. As the report from the Yugoslav army on slide 32 demonstrates, it was clear that Captain Dragon was working with and for the Serbian Ministry of Internal Affairs under the supervision of Jovica Stanisic. I would like to show you on slides 33 and 34 a letter drafted by Captain Dragon on the 8th of November, 1991. You can see his signature at the bottom of slide 33. At this time, Vasilkovic did not fully appreciate Stanisic's demand for secrecy and candidly revealed his connections with the DB in this request we see on slide 34, where he stated that he had, quote, the obligation towards the state security service of the Republic of Serbia close quote, and his activities had to be, quote, fully in accordance with the mentioned service, close quote. In this excerpt from the Kula dedication tape on slide number 35, we can see Jovica Stanisic embrace Captain Dragon when he gives him an award. In early April, as Milan Martic began to cobble together a police force of mostly unarmed and untrained men, 
Samatovich and Captain Dragon arrived, bearing the support of Jovica Stanisic and Slobodan Milosevic. Martic took the state security delegation of Samatovich and Captain Dragon to Gola Beach, nine kilometers north of Kanin, where within a few days they established a Serbian DB training center to prepare Serbs for the takeover of Serb lands in Croatia. The training that would take place created a formidable, well-equipped fighting force that not only prevented the Croatian government from imposing its will in the Kraina, but would be used to ethnically cleanse the Kraina of non-Serbs. Six years later in Kula, Mr. Samatovic would refer to Golubic as one of the accomplishments of his unit. In all, over 3,000 men received training in Golubic. Some who received this training would go on to set up some of the next 25 training camps Stanisic and Samatovic would establish. These first members of the special units would be dubbed with the name Keninjas because of the proximity of the Gola Beach camp to Kanin. One of the early battles that the Keninjas would fight in was in Galena. After the battle, Captain Dragon would distribute some red berets this would become one of the emblems of the unit and be the basis of their most commonly used name, the Red Berets. Here on slide 36 are some pictures of prominent members as well as a display case in the Kostic Training Center in Kula in which the Red Beret is in the center of the display surrounded by weapons. And while the unit was referred to by several names over the course of its history, its use of the Red Beret remained a constant. And although some military units not directly affiliated with the DB also donned berets of this color, the Red Beret soon became emblematic of the units of the Serbian DB. Much of what we know about the birth of the special units is corroborated by documents the Office of the Prosecutor has been able to obtain. I will take this opportunity to show the Chamber some of the most significant to show the chamber some of the most significant of these documents. Slide number 37 shows a proposal drafted by Captain Dragon. In May 1991, Captain Dragon sent a proposal to set up a new training center and transfer the main staff of the territorial defense to the Kanin Fortress. To whom did he send this proposal? Commander of the TO, the territorial defense, the president of the municipal assembly, and the security service. It is the case of the prosecution that the phrase security service refers to the Serbian State Security Service and more precisely Jovica Stanisic and Franko Shamatovic. 
As we can see from this document on slide number 38, on the 14th of June, just a few weeks after Captain Dragon made his proposal, Captain Dragon and Frankie, the name that Franko Samanovich was known by, held a planning meeting attended by several officers of the Yugoslav army. This document confirms what witnesses will describe, that the Yugoslav army was not a neutral presence in the Kraina. Two days later, Savatovich would issue a written order. Slide 39 is a photo of the original document. It is an order signed by Franko Savatovich ordering the removal of all weapons and armaments from the Kanin Fortress to Gola Beach. This order gives an insight into how Mr. Shamatovich viewed his authority in the Kraina. It is he and not the Yugoslav army, not Milan Babic, not Milan Martic, who gives the order on such an important matter as the removal of weapons. You will by this time have noted the letterhead Republic of Serbia, SAO Kraina, Training Center, Gola Beach. He would sign the order not with his full name, but in keeping with the importance of secrecy with his nickname, Frankie, the name most would come to know him by. The prosecution will also tender documents such as the one on your screens, which makes reference to orders given by Frankie. According to the author of this report, shown on slide 41, the Serbian Ministry of Internal Affairs previously provided four vehicles. Two months after receiving the equipment, the author reports that he received an order from Frank, F-R-E-N-K, who he explains is the chief representative of the Serbian MUP to remove radio equipment from two of the vehicles. Around this time period, Captain Dragon drafted a report. Based on the initial success of Captain Dragon, he now proposes a way for the special units of the Serbian DB to grow. He believes their objective must be more than simply training individuals. He has a vision for training men who can go to other areas of Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina and establish new training facilities and new branches of the special units. As slide number 42 shows, he suggests that the three men directly responsible for this initial success tour the field to boost morale. Those three men being Milan Martic, Frankie, and Captain Dragon himself. He suggests that these three, as well as prominent specials, a reference to members of the special units, visit these newly formed local formations to boost morale and to, quote, give advice on further formation of units in the field." Close quote. The prosecution will produce other reports that demonstrate Frankie or Mr. Samadovich, along with the local Serb leaders, were provided detailed information about what was transpiring in the Kraina. 
On slide 43, you can see a report, the 19th of July, 1991. It bears pointing out with this document the use of the term special units. Perhaps the first use of this term to describe these units created by the Serbian DB. The significance of the training they received is evident in the last sentence. Quote, our forces are deployed according to the training plan. Close quote. Slide 44 shows a report from the 6th of August, 1991, announcing a ceasefire. We can once again, uh, sorry, announcing a ceasefire, you see Mr. Samanovich's alias or nickname, Frankie. On your screen, you will see two excerpts of reports from July, 1991. Also during that summer, on the 19th of July, Captain Dragon made a detailed report to his superiors, Frankie, Milan Martic, and Major Ficha, who according to the JNA Intelligence Service, was an inspector in the MOOP of Serbia. From the outset, it is clear that the people they have trained and equipped are perpetrating war crimes. To Captain Dragon's credit, his initial view of this behavior was that it was something that needed to be corrected. As the chamber will see over the course of this trial, these crimes were not incidental to the plan, but an integral part of it. In the second report on slide 45, an excerpt from a 23rd July report, we can see from the earliest days of the unit, less than three months after its establishment, an organized system of reporting has been established. We can see from this document that one of Captain Dragon's foundational tasks in the Kraina was to organize a system of command and reporting that included the Republic of Serbia. Did Stanisic and Samadovic receive reports about the activities of the units they created? Did Milosevic know what they were doing? I draw your attention to slide 46 and once again to the Kula video. In this segment, Stanisic takes Milosevic over to a dress formation of the unit's senior commanders and they introduce themselves. After being saluted by Cernogorats, Milosevic shakes his hand and then walks over to Colonel Rayo Bozovic. We do not have the sound on the video, but I would ask that the video be played now and I will make an observation about their exchange once it's concluded. For the benefit of those who will be watching this in BCS, I will read the English and, uh, and ask the translators to translate into BCS. It seems that the audio problem has been corrected, so it appears that uh, the BCS was broadcast. 
It is the prosecution's case that Milosevic, through Samatovic and Stanisic, were regularly informed of where their unit was and what it was doing. In this exchange, Milosevic is meeting Bozovic in person for what appears to be the very first time. Milosevic, upon hearing the name, recognizes it immediately from reading his reports. Reports, the prosecution asserts, must have passed through Samatovic and Stanisic. Reports that were provided with sufficient frequency that Milosevic quickly recognized the name. I would now invite Ms. Bramer Metz to address the role Mr. Stanisic and Mr. Samatovic played in the crimes committed in Croatia and in Bosnia. May it please the court, Mr. President, your honors. As the seams of Yugoslavia unraveled, large concentrations of Serb minorities living in Croatia began to declare themselves to be in an autonomous region, a region that while it lay within the geographic boundaries of Croatia, was not bound by Croatia law or governmental administrations. These self-declared regions were called Serb Autonomous Regions or SAOs, the acronym from the BCS language. In August 1991, Milan Martic decided to take control of the Croatian village of Kijevo, situated southeast of Knin. Martic issued an ultimatum to the Kijevo police station, threatening to attack the civilian population of the village. At this moment, the Yugoslav army openly entered the conflict on the Serb side. After the ultimatum had expired, a combined force of Martic's men, the Yugoslav army, and the local Serb reservists, or TO members, attacked and took control of Kievo and removed the entire Croat population. From this time onwards, the Yugoslav army and the local Serb Kraina armed forces, that is, the police forces, the TO units, and some Serb volunteer units, many of them trained, equipped, financed, and supported by the Serbian DB under Jovica Stanisic and Franko Simatovic, started attacking Croat villages in the SAO Kraina. The TO, that is the territorial defense in the former Yugoslavia, were comprised of former members of the Yugoslav People's Army that retained their uniforms and a weapon and remained as reservists under the command of the Republic in times of peace and were incorporated into the Yugoslav army in times of war. In August 1991, Slobodan Milosevic would settle a dispute between Babic and Martic over the control of the TO forces by forcing Babic to appoint Milan Martic as deputy commander of the TOs. This appointment, together with the fact that many of the TOs in SAO Kraina were loyal only to Martic, ultimately led to Martic's control over the TOs. On 1st August 1991, the SAO Kraina government decided that the police special purpose units 
and the TOs would jointly form the armed forces of the SAO Kraina. Slide number 47 that is now shown illustrates the locations in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and in particular the municipalities and villages that are of relevance for the indictment against Jovica Stanisic and Franko Simatovic. The villages in SA Ukraina that I will deal with now have been marked with red circles. And in the circle that is at the bottom of the map, you can also see the town of Knin and Golubic. Dubica, Bacin and Cerovjani are visit villages situated on the border between Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 1991, approximately one half of the inhabitants living in Dubica were of Croat ethnicity with a small Muslim <coughs> minority, whereas the villages of Bacin and Cerovjani were predominantly Croat. Until 1991, the relations between the ethnic groups had been friendly and harmonious. In summer 1991, however, these relations deteriorated. Armed clashes occurred between the Croatian and Serb armed forces and in September 1991, the Croatian army withdrew. Serb forces, and in particular, Martic's police and his TO, took control of the villages. They came repeatedly, burning the houses of Croat inhabitants, using them as human shields, and killing people. They did, for example, not refrain from firing a rocket launcher at the bell tower of the Catholic Church of Dubica. After that, Croats decided to leave their village. Only a few elderly and sick remained. On 20th October 1991, members of Martic's police and of Milicia Kraina went around Dubica with a truck, picking up a total number of 53 of the remaining civilians and taking them to a fire station in Bachi. They pretended that a meeting would be held there. In fact, at the fire station, the people were detained. One of those detained was Slavko Kuchuk. He witnessed that some 10 civilians were later released, apparently because of connections they had with Serbs. He himself was let go by one of the guards who happened to be a former student of his. Slavko Kuchuk later compiled a list of the people that were detained together with him in the fire station. Looking at the ages of the civilians on the list that is shown now on slide 48, you will notice that the vast majority of them were older than 60. The following day, the remaining civilians in the fire station were executed by the Serb forces, together with a number of elderly civilians from Bacin and Cerovjani. <coughs> One of those killed was a 90-year-old woman. The village of Saborsko is located in Ogulin municipality near Plitvice. In August 1991, its population was almost entirely Croat, as was that of the neighboring villages of Polyanak, Lipovaca, 
and Vukovici. These villages were surrounded by villages with mostly Serb population. In August 1991, Serb forces started shelling Sabosko, aiming at linking the Serb territories that were separated by it. In the following months, members of Martic's police and other Serb forces started a campaign of harassment, arbitrarily arresting, detaining, and in many cases, severely beating Croat civilians. Most of the Croats left the villages as a result of this. In late October and early November 1991, Poljanak, Lipovaca, Vukovici and finally Saborsko were again subject to attacks by Serb forces. In the course of these attacks, Croat civilians were deliberately and intentionally murdered. In Vukovici, for example, members of Martic's police, JNA, and local Serb territorial defense units removed eight Croat civilians from a house among them both elderly and women. They lined them up against a wall and simply shot them. Another man who was too sick to leave the house was shot by Serb forces while still in bed. On 12th November 1991, Serb forces started a further heavy attack on Saborsko. The village was first attacked by JNA planes, dropping bombs, and then by heavy artillery. Afterwards, ground units moved into Saborsko. Slide number 49 refers to this attack. It is a letter of a representative of the village of Plashki explaining the attack as directed against evil people. The Catholic Church in Saborsko was shelled and damaged. Subsequently, the artillery withdrew, leaving Serb soldiers and policemen in the village. Those Serb forces then started looting the hamlet, driving away private cars, stealing household goods and cattle, and burning houses. Civilians were pulled from basements, men were separated from women, and some 20 men were executed. Most of the inhabitants of Saborsko fled or were taken by bus and released in Croatian territory. During the course of this trial, we will present witnesses that will speak about the attack on Saborsko. On slide number 50, you see quotes of the testimony of one of them during the trial against Milan Martic. You will notice, as is highlighted in red, that when asked who took part in the attack on Saborsko, the witness answered that these had been men trained in Golubic, the Red Berets. And as a final example, Škabrnja. Škabrnja and the surrounding villages are situated near Zadar in southwestern Croatia. In 1991, the village was almost entirely Croat. Following the pattern that I have described, this area was shelled and bombed by Serb forces from September 1991 onwards. The final attack took place on 18th November 1991. There were three Catholic churches in and around Skabernia. One of them was the Church of the Assumption of the Virgin. The following photos on slide 51 show this church before the attack and afterwards. 
It was shot and damaged by a JNA tank. Members of Marchich's police, JNA, and local Serb territorial defense units took the civilians out of the village and transported them against their will to territory controlled by the Croatian government. Serb forces moved from house to house, searching for those who remained and looting and burning the houses. In all, some 38 civilians were killed in Skabernia. On 21st December 1991, Matic's police, in joint operations with other Serb forces, forced themselves into houses in the tiny village of Bruska, which is situated between Skabernia and Benkovac. They took the men outside, lined them up, and shot them. They also fired at a fleeing woman. In all, nine people were killed. All this shows the repeated and eventually predictable pattern of attacks on Croat villages in the Kraina in the fall and winter of 1991. Villages with Croat population were first put under JNA siege, blockaded, and then often shelled. After that, Serb forces, including Martic's police, entered the villages, non-Serb buildings were destroyed, non-Serb property looted. Very often, individual Croats were arrested and detained, others were driven out. Those that remained, mostly the elderly population, were murdered, thus ethnically cleansing the villages. Again, I would like to refer you to what a witness who is going to be called by the prosecution said in the trial against Milan Martic. An excerpt of his testimony is shown in slide 53. This witness was personally present when Franko Simatovic, acting on behalf of Jovica Stanisic, brought weapons and money to Milan Martic in Knin. For reasons that are unclear, the relationship with Captain Dragan temporarily cooled after the summer of 1991, and he was recalled to Belgrade and forbidden by Stanisic to return to the Kraina. As Captain Dragan's Kninja broke up, Franko Simatovic handpicked the best among them to create a select group that would be cultivated into a more organized and professional covert fighting force. This would take place in Mount Fruškagora in Serbia proper. Your Honours, if I might refer you back to slide 22 of this presentation or to map 6 of the map book, we will show it again later in the opening, but you will see Fruškagora on the right-hand side of the map, just outside eastern Slavonia on Serbian territory. It's the fourth box from the top where it states Lejimir Mount Fruškagora. Here on Mount Fruškagora, the elite force was within striking distance of eastern Slavonia where there was a tentative peace, or Bosnia, which was quickly reaching the boiling point. Dragan Vasilkovic would be brought back to help train these men on Mount Fruškagora. Žika, also known as Cernogorac, was appointed the head of the unit. He, like the others, would be issued a red beret, a state security identification number, and a nickname. Stanisic would keep this evolving unit out from the public eye by keeping them 
as part of the state security service and not part of the ordinary police or military units of Serbia or the SFRY. The prosecution's case is summarized on slide number 54. It is the prosecution's case that Jovica Stanisic and Franko Simatovic's role in the organization, training, and outfitting of the direct perpetrators of these crimes as one of the contributions they made to a joint criminal enterprise to forcibly remove Croats and other non-Serbs from targeted lands through the crimes of persecution and murder makes them individually criminally liable for these crimes. And looking at the clock, Your Honours, before I move on to an entirely different subject, I would propose that this is a convenient moment to break up for today. It is. Um, <clears throat> for the day and we'll resume tomorrow the 10th of June quarter past two in this same courtroom one <clears throat> all rise for your overview